All right, great to be back here. Um, now, education. I mean, as uh, Mr. Peter Obi says all the time, if we're going to make progress, two, two, two fields cannot be overlooked education, healthcare. Now, we've spoken to the challenge of education on several occasions. What we know for a fact is that what you get out is what you put into it. I want to talk through issues in education, layers of them, but we don't have the time. I'd just like to come in with Dr. Obiagili Ezekwesli and to ask um, my dear sister, Obi, to lay out for us what the big problems are in education in Nigeria. She's had uh, a role as Minister of Education, and we've spoken to this subject several times in our conversations. So in a quick couple of minutes, if Obi sets us uh, uh, going off, then uh, my colleagues here in the studio will chip in for us to make sense of where policy is and where we must be going if we are to reap a demographic dividend in this country. Abi. But, uh, I, had to, I had to tear myself out of the meeting on uh, the funeral uh, activities for Chief Mbazulika Mechi, the uh, legendary one who was uh, one of our uh, front row nationalists, uh, first minister of uh, aviation uh, for, uh, in the First Republic. Um, and I just wanted to um, respond quickly to this and uh, get back to uh, the session with them. On education, I think um, the, uh, the, the, the very strong, I, I'm unable to use my video, unfortunately, so please bear with me. You would have to uh, make do with my, my audio. Is that okay, Pat? Okay, yeah, Because sure, I sure. see someone, yes. Okay. Um, on education, I think that um, we have enough analytical evidence of how important it is for um, ed ed economic development. Uh, the case is made that education has gone beyond being a social good uh, to being uh, not just a social good, but also an economic imperative for the growth of any society. As a matter of fact, as more research advanced, we came to the conclusion that uh, the real reason that uh, human capital is important is because uh, the, as we advance in knowledge through technology, uh, the contribution of uh, education to growth uh, just continues to, uh, be, uh, to be more uh, accentuated. To that extent, therefore, uh, for a continent that we uh, see a reversal of its uh, economic performance to its, um, to its growth, uh, to, to its natural endowment, we can clearly come to the conclusion that the lack of emphasis on economic or the lack of emphasis on the, uh, on the power of economic uh, uh, growth by human capital uh, that explains our story. The more natural resources we have found on our continent, the less the economic performance of our continent. And so anyone who thinks that uh, an additional discovery of one commodity or the other would be the basis of our economic growth has not been paying attention to the analysis that show clearly that uh, we are stuck in the low equilibrium growth that comes from a uh, very uh, a perverse, uh, or per per perverse behavior of uh, the politics of uh, the continent because of the contestation for um, minerals and the resources that come, the process of those uh, resources. To that extent, therefore, we can conclude that those who want to continue uh, the old paradigm of emphasis on uh, natural resources uh, don't have a new, a new set of ideas with which to work. I believe very much in the power of education. And I've seen uh, the, the contribution that education has made. Sorry, uh, Obi, Obi let, me, let, me, let me interfere 
you know, here and, and, and staying in line with what you're saying. One university in California, Stanford, is probably responsible for more capital than the capital available in the entire continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. And all they have done is create some human capital, mm -hmm. some of who just went across the road, literally, into Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and created companies which in a very short period of time, while they were still in their 20s, made them holders of billions and billions and billions of dollars in, in capital. Yet, mm -hmm. if you look at education budgets in Nigeria, it is almost ridiculous that we don't mm -hmm. seem to understand the game the world is playing in terms of our investment in education. And even that education mm -hmm. which we are giving, and I go back to Paulo Freire and the pedagogy of the oppressed, the nature of the piggy bank mindset in which we are still using colonial type, you know, uh, understanding of education. Uh, what what uh, must we do in terms of budgeting or mm -hmm. freedom of the system? And I, and I say this particularly because sitting here with me is Emmanuel Oji, who uh, leads a group called, called AFED, Association for Formidable Education Development in Nigeria, AFED is low cost school, owners of low cost schools in like uh, blighted neighborhoods and all of that, who educate mm -hmm. more of our children than government mm -hmm. schools. Mm -hmm. So, some thinking about private investment in education is critical. So, in terms of general okay. strategy and budget, how should we yes. be approaching education? So, the first thing you must not do is to assume that the most critical problem to solve in education is to give it more money. Uh, I know for a fact that um, the more money that, uh, what, however incremental it was over the decades that we gave to education, the less uh, the, uh, the, uh, the learning outcomes in education. And every education system has to be about the learning outcomes. If you have all the children in school, but they really are not learning. We have wasted investment in education, and we have actually blighted the, the future of our children even more. So what must we do? We must look at uh, the issue of funding education from the perspective of how it correlates to performance in education. Uh, and you use the word rightly, investment, which is entirely different from budget. Investment in education means that you must be evidence-based in investing in the things that have a, a higher probability of influencing learning outcomes. And it therefore means that you need a lot of research and a lot of data around what works, what interventions improve learning outcomes. And where in the chain of what we call education as a system and education as a sector, education as a process. All of these are very different things. So education as a system, what we have found through research is that the foundational literacy and numeracy skills, which really start off children very well in life, just the basic foundational skills, the skills of literacy and numeracy, they are the age of 10, you would be shocked that nine out of every 10 African children are not acquiring minimum proficiency in literacy and numeracy in our continent. The rest of the world, the, the number is uh, something of seven out of 10. Uh, in uh, uh, the middle income countries, it's an average of five to six out of 10. In high income countries, it's an, an, you know, one out of 10 not achieving. So you can see that we are, we are stuck in a very bad situation. We must first, therefore, correct everything that would support a solid foundation for the children because it's a predictor of lifelong capacity to learn and therefore capacity to earn. Uh, so what must we do there? We must invest in the things that research has shown to influence 
learning outcomes for children. So structured pedagogy is an important aspect of it. What does this mean? Some basic things of making sure that the curriculum, as well as learning plans, as well as the coaching, the training and the coaching of the teachers, as well as textbooks that children use at that foundational level, enable them to grasp the science of learning. And, and so uh, just correcting the foundation can lay a stage for what would happen with secondary education and for what would happen with a tertiary education and other forms of informal adult education. And, and then we can see clearly that uh, the further investment in education has to go from the perspective of identifying who best can pay for education. At the foundational literacy level, there is absolutely no reason why we should, as a state, leave that to the vagaries of the market. Uh, what we should really do is that those who have the capacity to pay and would love to give their children the kind of education that is uh, pricey, let them go ahead and do so. But we must not leave the poor uh, with failing public institutions. Uh, uh, today, what we also know about research in early, in uh, childhood, in uh, sorry, in uh, foundational literacy and numeracy is that, uh, you know, uh, what we call nursery schools, which has been the preserve of the middle class of Africa to the utter neglect of the children of the poor, is so important because at the year of three, uh, between two and three, that's when the learning capacity is unlocked for a child. Mm. In the case of the poor, which constitutes more than 65% of the children that we have in public school, that, that we have in the country, stuck in public schools, these children at that age are in markets or on the roadsides with their parents or at home, drinking ogi, drinking akamu. And that even worsens their fate in life because it stultifies their capacity to learn. So it means that uh, early child uh, care education has to be very high on the agenda of any serious government that wants to tackle the issues of inequalities that immediately start in the lives of people now, now, through the, uh, lack of access to quality you, you, education. You bring up something and so then, very important there, and I think it's, it's important we engage it. Uh, just to make a point, many, many years ago, back in the Babangida days, uh, as a friend of mine, the late uh, Hashim, Abu Bakr Hashim, was palm sec in education. And I stopped by to see him one evening, and I was complaining bitterly about allocation to education. And he said to me, look, the one that is allocated, his staff just used to organize conferences and print bags and make. There you go. And I, and I, said, go. To, and I said to him, yes, but you are a leader. That is your business to check. Because, now, and I brought this point of early childhood education. We need to massively invest in retraining child, uh, teachers of entry-level kids, those two, three-year-olds, where the foundation is laid. But the politics of Nigeria make us focus so much on ASU and university mm -hmm. education, and we mm -hmm. miss the foundational level, mm -hmm. which is where it matters the most. Um, what can but, we do? But you know, Pat, yeah. um, you, you, you know, Pat, that uh, the, when you look at uh, the dynamics of power, it goes in the direction of the middle income class on our continent. Mm -hmm. And we have an utterly um, selfish middle class. Uh, the middle class is the educated class, so they have voice. And because they have voice, they have much more political power. Right. And therefore, they can uh, determine what is the agenda setting of government in many ways. Mm. So you see the middle class of Africa, they would pay the best kind of money to give your children this, uh, 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 what you call it, nursery education, that is early child care education, give them a foundational education in, a, in a junior secondary and a secondary. But as soon as it gets to university education, they want the government to take to pick up the the cost mm -hmm. of that education, and and so uh, in, in that way, what what they then do is that they hold the government hostage to mm -hmm. whatever it is that they want 
And, and so the priority for them is tertiary education. Therefore, the priority of government becomes tertiary education because it's a mutually, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what, what's the word that we use for it? It's a mutually uh, engaging or self-serving kind of conversation between the government and the middle class. Mm. Now, this is unfair because it means that we don't have constituency for basic education, the foundational education. And so we must break that. The government must be the people that have the care for the majority of the people in the land who are in poverty. Mm -hmm. And they must concentrate very much in seeing how we can fix foundational literacy. We need to get sec a, 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 a early child care education, uh, junior uh, secondary education, uh, senior secondary education as much as possible, uh, working. And then we can have this discussion around the tertiary education from the perspective of what we know, that when people get tertiary education, the economic benefit of uh, tertiary education, a lot of it packs into the pocket of the beneficiary yes. of tertiary education. And that to that extent, therefore, we must allocate the kind of cost for funding that kind of education in a way that ensures that the benefits are Absolutely. understood and, and that the financing it ties into how the cost allocation goes. Let me end on this, on yes. this note, mm -hmm. uh, but you see, if we want education to unlock our economic growth, we do need to uh, be much more data-driven. We do need to understand what the barriers to our economic growth in different sectors of the economy are. And we do need to design our relevance and quality of curriculum, especially at the level of uh, the, uh, the, the, the skills development from that orientation. We, uh, you know, when I've seen uh, what you said about your permanent secretary, Frank, lay out, I've often said to them that as Minister of Education, I had to use an analytical process to understand what had happened to budgets of Ministry of Education in the past. And, you know, I said to my, 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 uh, my colleagues in the Ministry of Education at that time, in the wider sector of education, as, I, as we looked at the inverse relationship between budget and performance, I said to them, is this the Ministry of Education or the Ministry of Works? Mm -hmm. Because there was much more interest in transaction-related yes. activities in education yes, than there was any interest in the policy dimensions of education, of education yeah. on the regulatory issues, quality assurance issues, in the investment in professional teachers' development, and the coaching that is absolutely necessary, on the investment in technology that was necessary because as the world began to progress, it was important that instructional materials would reflect that level of awareness and knowledge of the world. Now, what I said to them then, which holds strong today, is that if you fund a dysfunction well, okay, what you would have is a well-funded dysfunctionality. <laughs> you, don't, you don't simply say to yourself, ah, education needs money. Let's give it more budget. You give it 22% budget. In order that 22% budget will fund your dysfunction. Well, it's a well-funded dysfunction. What you need is an education system that works. It therefore requires that you should do what we call prior actions. Your prior actions are bold and courageous reforms in the governance of education, in the issue of teachers, in the issue of your curriculum, on the issue of your uh, of instructional methods and, and, and all that is associated with it, on issues of equity in education, on issues of the role of technology in education, on the issues of the reform of the policy environment for education. So there are just some, and then of course, there is a salient issue uh, on, the, on the matter of finance in education. Mm -hmm. the, and this is a conversation that we've been running from. We have to have the conversation on how we finance mm -hmm. education. Countries of uh, they, you know, more advanced economies are even forced to have that conversation. Yes, they absolutely. keep going back to the table to look at it all over again and to figure out how to ensure that everyone 
who NIMOS that educated at the foundational level has quality education at that level, regardless of what their station in so life might be. Is. And then when it comes to tertiary education, there has to be a conversation on how to allocate risk and uh, benefits, right? Cost benefits and all of that. I mean, so, so much, I, uh, so, so I much really that we can learn yeah, for the so opportunity of, uh, you mm -hmm. know, giving my few, uh, my few thoughts to this. Thank, thank you, Pat. Thank I you so much, Obi. Right? Yes, uh, thank you. We'll let you get back to that meeting, but the issues that you have laid down, uh, we will track up in the next 10 minutes before we go to the next segment as our time is almost uh, uh, running out. But I I'd like for us to pick up on the business of funding education. Who should be funding education? What? I mean, very important is the point made about tertiary education. I've tried to do that. Sometimes you are misunderstood. There's so much obsession with tertiary education. University education, is it being funded well? Not, but, you know, government must fund it. Some people will argue, no, 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 no. But it is this elite conspiracy that leads us there. We miss the most important stage in education, which is that early childhood education. Who should be funding education? How should we spread the cost? I mean, the average, you know, one clear example, uh, Professor Nzigu, you here have been uh, a professor in the United States for such a long time, and you, you can relate to this. I tell my friends who are practicing in the United States, doctors, many of them were educated in Nigerian universities. Their colleagues who they are working with in the US basically are paying for getting that medical education many, many years after they leave medical school. These Nigerian colleagues basically got free education in Nigeria and moved to the United States with that education and, and, and all of that, which shows elite conspiracy around tertiary education. It's not a conversation as who likes, but tertiary education, people should pay more for it because they use it more for themselves right. than for society. Yes. Where it is more important, that base level, where that education for everybody builds up society, they don't ask for its funding. And so you get this ridiculous thing yes. where a person pays uh, two, three million naira a term for the child to go to private school, uh, 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 primary level, and wants university education, to be free. How did we get to this absurdity? And how can we begin to restructure education funding in Nigeria? Uh, Prof, uh, I think, uh, first of all, obviously it all, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the foundation, the foundation uh, for education. I think uh, coming directly to your question, mm -hmm. yes, in the United States, uh, remember again that um, education, mm -hmm. you know, is one of the drive engines mm -hmm. that grows every economy. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. So, for example, when you talk about this funding, mm -hmm. I think um, what we have right now in the UB data about how do we going to be able to fund that particular area mm -hmm. is the issue and the fundamentals that we will no longer, for example, make the government pay everything, that we're going to come out with a loan, a loan package. Mm -hmm. Whereby, for example, between 10 and 20 years, people can be able to pay back this money. Because if they give it free, People take it away free, and they don't have anything to do with it. So the best thing right now is to make sure after that, you remember again that we're talking about free education for primary and secondary. Mm -hmm. And then they go in back, for example, the tertiary one. So the tertiary one, for example, should be a package whereby, for example, people don't have that particular resources, can be able to have a bank. The be that is planning to come out with a banking system whereby people can be able to have you know, opportunity to have loan, yeah, but they can be able to pay over uh, about 20 year period. So that with that gives the people opportunity to be able to enhance that particular education policy they have. Yes. I think that's one of the key issues here. And one of the issues in uh, funding education is that there is this make-believe that most of the children of the poor go to poorly managed government schools, which is a big lie. Yes. Because most of the children of the very poor Actually, the poor spend more on education of their children than the rich do. Correct. As a percentage of their income. Yes. It's not coming free from any government schools. Yes. The statistics on how many children in Lagos 
of the very poor go to private schools can be given to us by Emmanuel Oji, who is president uh, of AFED, or chair, right? Yes, of AFED. And AFED is low cost primary schools, private enterprise in poorer neighborhoods, if you will, um, around which a lot of work has been done. I, I have been associated with this process. I'm actually a, a, a patron of uh, AFED, national patron. And, 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 I, and I was interestingly brought into this process by an Englishman, uh, James Tooley, Professor Tooley, who is Vice Chancellor of Buckingham University, hmm. uh, used to be at University of Newcastle, and has done a lot of work on these um, schools in several countries around the world, low cost private schools. Um, so, Emmanuel, what, what, what is the kind of percentage of people who go to school in Lagos go to AFED type schools? Yes, uh, good evening, Nigeria, and those joining us from the diaspora. Prof, thank you for this opportunity. Um, let me say clearly, um, we've been on this debate for a long period. Uh, like I was discussing with Prof earlier, I said we are on the group that disagree with the figure of 20 million out of school children. Mm. Um, because a um, uh, uh, majority of our kind of school are not in the government rather. Yes. And on that note, the number of children who attend this kind of school are not accounted for. Mm. So they are, constitute, uh, they are considered as out, out of school, school children. children. So if you come to Lagos, for instance, I think the statistics around 2007, conducted by Professor James Tully himself, um, revealed at that time, when they were saying that about 45% million, uh, 45 of the children that are out of school in Lagos, after the, after the research work, it shows that they were just about 4%. And not as if that percent were real, but it's just that in order to give it to, um, to not, not to leave anything to chance. Because when he went into these schools, local schools, he found these children learning. Okay. And of course, further to that, they conducted a test that showed that the children in this local private school were learning better than their counterpart in the public school. So the averagely, as at the last time, we are talking about close to a million children in Lagos alone. I'm not talking about across the nation. Attending those affair schools. Yeah, attending those affair schools. Uh, I, I can tell you, I, I had the privilege of visiting many of these uh, schools, including those on Kelus <laughs> in uh, Makoko. Makoko and all of that. I think uh, uh, when I was in some of the yes. entourage of yes. my uh, visits to this place, <laughs> and, and I felt thoroughly ashamed of myself <laughs> that as much as I thought I was a great policy activist and everything, it took somebody coming from England to come <laughs> and expose me to what was going on in my backyard, right. you know. And, but you know what government agencies spend most of their time doing? Trying to shut them down, finding all kinds of... Whereas they are the major providers Perfect. of education to the children of the poor. And that your driver pays 5,000 naira a month from the 30,000 naira yes. that you pay him for that child to, to go to one of those schools. Yes. So policy needs to address this. Yes. How do we, and this is the most important stage of education. Yes. How do we provide supplement, if you want to call it that, to strengthen the schools, ensure that that driver can send their child to this school in a better shape so that that early stage is taken care of, rather than fighting over how many billions more should we give to the university system. And I think this is a major debate that we should face in this country. Because, I, think, mm. I think that uh, basically is what Obi just mentioned mm -hmm. now, that um, we need to sit down and then use yeah. data. Because uh, we have a very yes. selfish middle yes. class. Yes, middle class. Yes. Very, very selfish. Very selfish middle class. Do that, and then come to the table whereby, for example, we should be able to find out how do we fund it. That mm -hmm. funding education is very, very important. Mm -hmm. I, was just, I was just looking at um, educational growth in Nigeria mm -hmm. of last, last, you know, first quarter. Education was on the top, on the bottom of the list, 1.4%, mm. 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 which means underfunded, sure. totally underfunded. But we look at the inflation rate of education, 15%, mm. which means that there's a big gap between the funding. Mm -hmm. So this is the reason why the obedient says we need to come to the table 
and then bring in people that actually knows what happens in the field mm -hmm. and be able to discuss how can we be able to fund education. Mm -hmm. It's not talking about doing this in the first 200 days. It's talking about doing this in the first 100 days so that we can come to the table mm -hmm. and be able to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. So it's so, uh, such fundamental value uh, uh, where education is and where we go. Unfortunately, time is out and we have to move on uh, to several other segments waiting for us. We're going to talk about uniting Nigeria. Yes. And how this takes us forward. So let's take a break. Uh, go back to the amazing, very, very amazing Adiboyi. And then we'll come right back and say go on. Thank you. Record, record. <laughs>